Hello, everybody. Um, um, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Yosuke Mukoyama, a uh, tenure track investigator in NHLBI. So it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Janet Rosan, uh, Chief of the Research in the Hospital for the uh, Sick Children, uh, called Sick Kids. So she has been a pioneer and innovator and an uh, outstanding researcher um, demonstrating a high, uh, high degree of creativity and then leadership in the field of the uh, mammalian development. So let me introduce um, briefly her research history. Um, after her graduate training in Oxford and Cambridge in UK, uh, she moved to the Canada and then joined, uh, joined the faculty at Brock University. And from, um, from 1985 to 2005, she was a leading researcher at the Samuel Runenfield Research Institute out, uh, at Mount Sinai. And then she joined Chick Kids in 2005 and became uh, chief of the research of the research institute. And she is also a professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rosant has been recognized for her enormous contributions uh, to science with uh, many hours, including the CIHL uh, Michael Smith uh, Prize in Health Research. Um, this is uh, the most prestigious uh, health research award in Canada. Um, she is also a fellow of the Royal Societies of London and Canada. And then in April 2008, she was elected uh, to the US National Academy of Science. So she serves as a deputy scientific director of the stem cell network, and then also serves on the International Society of the Stem Cell, uh, stem cell Research uh, to develop the general uh, guideline of the stem cell research and was involved in the stem cell debate. So lastly, um, I, want to, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, Dr. Rosant is a remarkable mentor who has uh, trained over 70 uh, 70 uh, postdoc and uh, research fellows from different countries. Um, and the many of those fellows uh, has become uh, independent academic professor or in, uh, investigators. In addition, at some meeting or conference, uh, she always encouraged young scientists like me to tackle the interesting or exciting um, questions in the field of the development of biology. So I hope um, the fellows in today's audience um, would have uh, such opportunities in the receptions after the, her talk. Well, actually, we, have, we only have a 30 minutes receptions after her talk. Okay, so I'll finish up my, research, uh, my speech and then please welcome Dr. Janet Rosant. Thank you, Yosuke. Thank you, uh, Yosuke. That was a very nice introduction and it's a, a real honor to be here to give this lecture this afternoon. Can you hear me with my... Yep, good. Uh, and what I want to do is to talk to you about my favorite stage of development, which is the blastocyst. So I, as I came in, uh, somebody said, well, you know, it's wonderful. I actually know what a blastocyst is. So I did wonder when I put this on the title how many people would know what a blastocyst is. But in the current debate around embryonic stem cells, blastocysts actually make it into the newspapers occasionally. But let me remind you why the blastocyst is an interesting stage of development. And I'm going to talk to you about the formation of the blastocyst in the mouse. And as we go through, I'm going to touch on issues that relate to stem cell biology and why understanding early development is critical for understanding the formation of stem cells, particularly embryonic stem cells. So this is the blastocyst. It's in the mouse. And, oops, wait a minute, I need the other one. Uh, this is a very beautiful stage of development. This embryo here has three cell types and three cell types only. This group of cells at one end here is called the inner cell mass. There's a cavity here, a fluid-filled cavity, and an outer rim of cells. 
This sort of shell of cells is called a trophectoderm. The inner cell mass contains two cell types called epiblasts. They're pink cells here because they're stained with an antibody to OCT4, which is one of the major pluripotency genes. These are the pluripotent cells of the embryo. And then on the surface of the inner cell mass are these cells called primitive endoderm, uh, which are stained in green here. And this stage has about 60 cells. It's the size of a speck of dust. And yet the embryo at this stage has already made some decisions about its life. It's decided to make two cell types, the trophectoderm and the primitive endoderm, which are extra embryonic, and they don't contribute to the development of the mouse itself. Everything that we think about as a mouse comes from these pink cells here. And if this was a human blastocyst, it would look much the same. It would not be so beautiful. Any of those of you who have looked at human blastocysts see they're pretty uh, disreputable kind of structures. They turn into beautiful human beings, but they don't look as beautiful as the mouse blastocyst. But it contains the same cell types. It's a, a slightly later stage. It takes a few more days. But essentially, the same lineage decisions occur. So over many, many years, my lab has been interested in understanding the story of the blastocyst. And we can ask three kinds of cell questions about it. First of all, these three cell types that we can recognize here now by their gene expression patterns, are they really lineage progenitors? And what do they give rise to later in development? How are they established? How do you take a single cell and in a few days develop three different lineages? And can we derive stem cell lines from the three different lineages of the mouse blastocyst? And I'm going to give you answers to the first and the last uh, right away. And we're going to focus today on the middle one. So the first one, we basically know this. And I'll give you the answer in the next slide. We know what these cell types give rise to from many experimental studies over many years by myself, my PhD advisor, many other early experimental embryologists in the mouse. And we know what they give rise to. We know that they are committed progenitors. We also know that we can derive stem cell lines not just from the pluripotent cells, but also from the other two cell types as well. And I'll briefly show you that. What we don't know is how do we actually get to this stage? And what are the pathways involved? And I'll tell you today how we think we're getting much closer now than we have been for a long time in understanding these early events. So what do they give rise to? simply shown here without giving any of you a very complicated lesson in mouse development. The, uh, blues, the cells on the outside, the trophectoderm, are the cells that give rise to the majority of the placenta, the trophoblast cells. So they are a key mammalian cell type that any mammalian embryo needs if it's going to survive in the uterine environment. The cells on the surface of the inner cell mass, which we call primitive endoderm, don't actually give rise in any large amount to the real gut endoderm. They are primitive, and they give rise to another extra embryonic layer, which is the endoderm of the yolk sac. And it's the pink cells and the pink cells only that give rise to the fetus, as well as a few other extra embryonic cell types. So a mammalian embryo spends its first few days making cells, the blue cells and the green cells, that are going to be thrown away at the end of development, but are absolutely critical for the embryo to survive in the uterine environment. It's a very small minority of cells that actually have the pluripotent capacity to make the fetus itself. So my lab's been long interested in how these extra embryonic cell types develop because we believe that it's very important for understanding the survival of the embryo and for understanding pregnancy disorders. If you don't have a placenta, you're not going to make it through to any other stage of development. And many people, when they study mouse mutations, find that there are many genetic pathways that impact on the formation of the placenta. So it's very important to understand it. But for a while there, we were sort of a little bit uh, working in the wilderness. Everybody said, oh, that's nice, studying trophoblasts, but why do you care? And I said, well, it's important. Where would you be without the placenta? And they know that. But when you're interested in fundamental developmental problems, everybody said the focus has to be on these cells, because that's where the body axis develops, the different cell types form. However, the world has come around a little bit to our side of the fence again, because we now know that not only do these uh, outer cells, the trophoblast and the primitive endoderm, be important for just survival of the embryo, they're actually key sources of signals that tell the epiblast how to become a mouse. 
So in early post-implantation development, it signals from the trophoblast and the primitive endoderm that begin the formation of the primitive streak, make the three germ layers, tell the head and the tail to be different. So everything we want to know about the development of the fetus requires that we understand the formation of the other cell types. So how can we help ourselves in understanding those cell types by, since this is a very small stage of development, it's very difficult to work with, can we derive stem cell lines that mimic the properties of those three cell types and provide us then with a molecular entree into the specification of the different cells of the blastocyst? And the answer here again is over, is summarizing a lot of work over many years from many labs, we now know that in the mouse, we can get from the blastocyst, from those three lineages, lineage-specific progenitors that reflect the cell types of the embryo. The most famous of those are embryonic stem cells. So embryonic stem cells in the mouse come from the epiblast progenitors within the inner cell mass. They, they grow in culture and self-renew indefinitely. They express transcription factors such as ALT4 and NANOG that are absolutely essential for maintenance of the pluripotent state both in the embryo, as you'll see later, and also in the embryonic stem cell. When you take those cells and put them back into the early embryo, they recapitulate what they would have done in the embryo itself. That is, they contribute to all the fetus, as shown here, with uh, blue uh, expressing ES cells, but they don't contribute to the yolk sac here, and they don't contribute to the placenta. So embryonic stem cells are pluripotent, they are not totipotent. It's an important distinction. However, we showed a few years ago now that from the trophectoderm, you can derive a different stem cell line called trophoblast stem cells or TS cells, which can also proliferate indefinitely in culture. They have their own specific transcription factors such as CDX2, which I'll come back to extensively, eomizodermin, that are required for specifying the trophoblast cell fate. And now, when you take those and put them back in the chimera, they don't make the fetus, but they contribute to the placenta, so they recapitulate their lineage memory. And then finally, more recently, we derived what we call Zen cells, or XEN cells, which come from the primitive endoderm, express specific transcription factors typical of primitive endoderms, such as GALA6 and SOX7, different phenotype, but they can be self-renewing indefinitely in culture, put them back in the embryo, and they contribute to the yolk sac. So now it's very nice because we have stem cell lines that we can use to do microarray analysis, do expression uh, control, a lot of experiments to look at the pathways that specify cell fate and specify cell renewal. And then we can take it back and ask whether those same genes are involved in the embryo. So that's been extremely important and the we can use stem cells to help inform us about the genetics of those early lineage decisions. I'm going to talk about the two lineage decisions today. I'm going to spend most, most of the time on the first lineage decision that the embryo undertakes, which is the formation of the trophoblast on the outside of the embryo versus the inner cell mass. And then if we have a little time, we'll touch on how the epiblast and the primitive endoderm also separate themselves in development. So how can we get at the genes that are important for trophoblast development? Well, one of the nice things you can do is that although embryonic stem cells, TS cells, and Zen cells have this restricted fate in culture, we know from a series of experiments, largely by Hitoshi Niwa, first in Austin Smith's lab and then in his own lab and in a collaboration with my lab, that you can use embryonic stem cells as an assay for the key transcription factors that specify the fate of primitive endoderm or trophectoderm. And in particular, what Hitoshi showed was that if you take embryonic stem cells and remove OPT4, this pluripotency power domain transcription factor, or add CDX2, which is a chordal homeom domain transcription factor, then ES cells change their phenotype and start to look like trophoblast, turn on the trophoblast genes, downregulate the pluripotency genes, if you now switch them to the growth factor conditions that promote TS cell proliferation, you end up with cells that behave exactly like trophoblast stem cells. So an ES cell can be turned into a TS cell by manipulating the transcription factor environment. So it's a nice assay for the key genes that are involved in trophoblast development.
So this assay told us that CDX2 was indeed a key trophoblast transcription factor and said that it was sufficient to drive the trophoblast cell fate. Uh, and so if we look at the stem cell situation, we now know from a lot of studies from many different labs quite a lot about this side, how we maintain the pluripotency state. We know that OX4, SOX2, NANOG, and an increasingly large number of transcription factors act in an autoregulatory cassette to maintain pluripotency. And downstream of that, they have a set of genes that, that are involved in the pluripotent state. We know that CDX2 is also autoregulatory, and we believe that it's a key player then in maintaining the trophoblast lineage differentiation in the trophoblast stem cells, and that in essence, you have a negative interaction here, so the, that CDX2 keeps off these genes, and OX4 and SOX2 turn off CDX2. So you can separate the two lineages by a negative interaction between them and then an autoregulatory loop. That's a kind of genetic hierarchy that you can imagine in many other situations as being a good way to achieve lineage restriction. So we know that this is true in, in stem cells, and I won't go through all the, all the details about this. The question we wanted to ask was whether the same kind of interaction is also true in the embryo. So if these are the pluripotency genes, are they important for the inner cell mass? And is CDX2 playing the same role in the trophectoderm? And do we see an autoregulatory, a negative regulatory interaction between the two? So we have to go back to the embryo. So this is what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be jumping from stem cell to embryo and back again. So with this information about stem cells, we went back and asked, what happens in the embryo? First of all, we simply asked, what's the expression pattern of these different genes? So CDX2, which remember is sufficient to drive trophoblast cell fate in embryonic stem cells, has a very nice trophoblast restricted expression domain. At the blastocyst stage, here at, uh, three, at uh, by, uh, in, in situ to the messenger RNA, or up here with antibody to the protein, you see it restricted to those outside trophectoderm cells. It stays restricted in that lineage in the early post-implantation stages as well. But interestingly, prior to formation of this blastocele, the embryo is just a large group of cells called a morula, but even at this stage, CDX2 is restricted to the outside cells that are going to go on to form the trophectoderm. So the messenger RNA here, or the protein here. So CDX2 becomes restricted to the outside cells prior to blastocyst stage. So what happens to those pluripotency genes? It's not the same. So here's Alt4. This is to the message. Here it is within the, nucle within the uh, blastocyst, within the inner cell mass. The blue is Alt4 message, nicely in the inner cell mass. But in the late morula and even the early blastocyst, Alt4 message and Alt4 protein is in all the cells. The same is true of Nanog. I'm not sure I showed that. No. The same is true of Nanog. The two key pluripotency genes are expressed broadly in the pre-implantation embryo and don't get restricted until after the blastocyst begins. So that tells us then that CDX2 comes on first and OX4 only gets turned off afterwards, suggesting to us, and we propose, that CDX2 is probably the initiator of this lineage distinction and that CDX2 might be important for negatively regulating OX4 and NANOG. It comes on in the outside cells. As it comes on, it will turn off the pluripotency genes. You'll now get trophectoderm and inner cell mass separating and the autoregulatory loops will ensure maintenance of linear segregation. So if that was true, the question is, what happens if you knock out CDX2? So we published this a few years ago, so I won't show this in detail, but CDX2 mutants, when they form, they make the beginnings of a blastocyst, but they never implant, and the blastocyst will collapse, it'll look as a sort of uh, a, a rather com complicated mess of cells, it won't make any further trophoblast. It can't make trophoblast stem cells. It can undergo no further trophoblast differentiation. It begins, however, to make a blastocyst. But importantly, when you look at those early blastocysts, where a wild-type embryo would have the outside trophoblast markers uh, restricted to the outside and the pluripotency genes on the inside, in these CDX2 mutants, OX4 and NANOG are expressed throughout the embryo.
And here's a picture of that in situ here. So we're looking at wild type embryos on the left, OCT4 on the top in the inner cell mass, Nanog somewhat patchy within the inner cell mass, which I'll come back to, but an inner cell mass restricted. And then in these two mutants, you can see they're making the beginnings of a blastocele, but OCT4 and Nanog are expressed throughout the embryo. Suggesting then that indeed, CDX2 does have an in, vitro, an in vivo role in the embryo, and its role is to negatively regulate these genes. And that's a key initiator of forming uh, the, uh, the separation between the inner cell mass and the trophoblast. But now remember, in stem cells, we also have the reverse, that OCT4 and the pluripotency genes are also important for negatively regulating CDX2. So is that true in the embryo? From the expression patterns, we would suggest that the initiation of CDX2, one would imagine, is independent of this negative regulation. Because remember, OCT4 is everywhere when CDX2 is restricted to the outside. But we don't actually know that. It requires us to go back and look at OCT4 mutants. So OCT4 mutants have been around quite a long time. Or since MISLAB, in a collaboration with Hans Schuller, knocked out OCT4. And they showed, as you might hope, this is a very important pluripotency gene, that blastocysts that, that lack OCT4 begin to form. You'll see that in a minute. They make blastocysts. But the inner cell mass doesn't survive. And inside cells seem to, later on, become trophectoderm. But when they published this in 1998, we didn't have any idea about the trophoblast-specific transcription factors. So they didn't look at what happens to genes like CDX2. So Amy Ralston, postdoc in the lab, has revisited this question and taken up four mutants and asked what happens to CDX2. And what we see is a wild type on the top with CDX2 in the outside cells of the blastocyst. And here's an OCT4 now, no OCT4 protein. But you can see that the initial stages, they look fine, and CDX2 is restricted to the outside. So the initiation of CDX2 does not depend on OCT4. However, if you let those embryos go one day further, and now they're four and a half day blastocysts, they're about to implant in the uterus. Here's the wild type, CDX2 on the outside, nothing in the inner cell mass. And now you see that CDX2 starts to become ectopically expressed in the inner cell mass. And you can see not every cell, but a lot of cells in the inner cell mass now turn on CDX2. So that tells us that OCT4 does have a role, but that when we're looking at the embryo, the initial event that separates the lineages is almost certainly dependent on this negative effect of CDX2 on the pluripotency genes. And that secondarily, down the road, these genes also have an ongoing maintenance role in keeping off CDX2 in the pluripotency lineage as well. So there is this interaction, but the timing of, of this can only be worked out by looking at the embryo itself. So if we want to know how to start this process, how we begin to segregate trophectoderm and inner cell mass, we need to really focus on what puts CDX2 in those outside cells because that's going to kickstart everything else. Um, before we do that, however, we better be sure that CDX2 is the game that we're after. I told you that over here, as people have looked particularly at embryonic stem cells, there's an increasing number of genes that fall into this pluripotency cassette. And I'm making it sound like all we have to do to make trophoblasts is have one gene, CDX2. Well, it's a nice story, but you know that biology never works that way. It certainly can't be true that CDX2 is the only game in town. So we better have a little bit more of a careful look at what's going on in this trophoblast side of the equation. Is CDX2 the prime factor driving trophectoderm differentiation? And the answer there is it's a key player, but it's not the only player. And in particular, two groups, one here at NIH and, and uh, one here actually at Suzaki's lab at uh, Recon CDB, published, you can't tell because it's cut off the end here, uh, last year, uh, a couple of papers that showed that a different transcription factor called T4 is actually probably upstream of CDX2 in specifying trophoblast fate. And T4 mutants, they both show died Prior to, for, to the CDX2 mutants, they actually really look worse. They're phenotypically more severe than CDX2. Where CDX2 starts to make a blastocyst, these embryos really don't get to that stage. 
But just like CDX2 mutants, these TED4 mutants also fail to downregulate the pluripotency genes, and they don't turn on CDX2 or any of the downstream trophoblast genes, suggesting then that this is a potential player upstream of CDX2. So now we can begin to build out a bit more of a gene, gene, uh, gene pathway over on the trophoblast side. We can put TED4 at the top currently, uh, and downstream of it, clearly CDX2. Uh, with its own targets. But remember, the TED4 phenotype is more severe than CDX2, suggesting then that there might be other targets downstream of TED4 important for trophoblast fate that we've yet to identify. So are there parallel pathways important for trophoblast fate? So how could we find such genes? Well, we can go back to the stem cell system again. And we can use our stem cells to try to identify more trophoblast stem cell specific transcription factors. And we can use our stem cell assays to ask whether they can actually drive trophoblast fate. So Amy, uh, John Draper, and Brian Cox in the lab have done a whole s a series of microarray expression profiling comparing embryonic stem cells, TS cells, and Zen cells. And then looking specifically here, sort, you can sort it for anything you want. This particular screen was around transcription factors. Looking for those transcription factors that were highly expressed in either TS cells or Zen cells, but not in ES cells. This is all compared to ES cells and not in the other stem cell type. So we're looking for TS-specific or Zen-specific transcription factors. Zen, interesting set here. That's another talk, but you can see some interesting genes that come up here. Some we knew about, some we're not so sure about. But down here is the trophoblast-specific one. Here's CDX2. EMRs we knew was an important trophoblast factor downstream of CDX2. IOX3 and HAND1 are also downstream of CDX2. But here was a surprise, GARDA3 coming up extremely highly in the TS cells and not in the other cells. And we had no, we had no preconception that GARDA3 was particularly important in the trophoblast lineage. So I only followed up on GARDA3, and then she did the NEWA assay. She said, what happens if we overexpress GARDA3 in embryonic stem cells? If this is an important gene for trophoblast cell fate, it might turn ES cells into trophoblast cells. And indeed, when you do that and compare with overexpression of CDX2, which we know makes trophoblast stem cells, GARDA3 cells clearly change their phenotype. And when you look at specific genes like eomizodermin uh, and uh, OCT4, then you see that if you compare overexpression of CDX2 or GARDA3, genes like eomizodermin come up. OCT4 is rapidly downregulated by CDX2, not so much by GARDA3. And we do believe that CDX2 is the key player in the negative regulation of the pluripotency genes. So that's its key role. But clearly, GARDA3 seems to be doing some changes and turning on at least some of the markers of trophoblast. But some of the markers isn't good enough, so then what Amy did with uh, Brian's help was to do microarray analysis and compare a whole set of trophoblast uh, core genes, which we've identified by a number of means. So it's 1,800 genes that we think are key for the whole trophoblast lineage, and compared what happens in the different overexpressions. And she's comparing what happens if you add CDX2 here or GADA3. And what you find is there are a set of downstream targets that are induced by both transcription factors. But interestingly, uh, GADA3 has its own set of targets that are not induced by CDX2. And CDX2 has its targets that are not induced by GADA3. And you'll note, of course, that CDX2 induces itself, which we would hope so, because we've told you it's autoregulatory. It also induces GADA3 and some of both upstream and downstream pathways. So there's a lot of feedback loops going on here. So suggesting then that both of these genes are turning on trophoblast genes, they have some targets in common, but they have some different targets, suggesting parallel pathways here. She could also ask how much of GARDA3 induction is dependent on CDX2. So are they really acting together and is that necessary? Because we have CDX2 mutant ES cells. So now you can take mutant ES cells and add GARDA3. And if everything that GARDA3 did, depending on had, having CDX2 there, then obviously nothing would happen. You can see again, phenotypically, they change. So there is a change. And indeed, when you look at the microarray profiling of those cells, then you can find sets of genes that are turned on by GARDA3, even in the absence of CDX2.
So this is, this is kind of interesting. What we're doing is comparing GADA3 induced on a wild type background with GADA3 induced on a null background. So here is a set of genes that are only induced by GADA3 when CDX2 is present. So these are CDX2 dependent, so they're presumably working together in some way. There's a set of genes here that are turned on by GADA3 even in the absence of CDX2, so they're independent, separate targets. And then these are kind of interesting. These are genes that are only turned on by GADA3 when CDX2 is absent, suggesting there are more complications here, that there are genes repressed by CDX2 that GADA3 activates. So without going into more detail, this is beginning to give us some interesting insights into the downstream uh, responses of these trophoblast uh, transcription factors, that there can be parallel pathways, uh, there can be separate targets, there can be overlapping targets, and there can be, be some negative interactions here where CDX2 actually prevents GADA3 turning on later trophoblast genes. It's going to have relevance to what goes on in vivo, and it's going to be something for Amy to sort out when she takes up her, her position. I'm not going to talk more about it today. The bottom line here, however, is that GADA3 becomes a new player in the trophoblast lineage. So how come we didn't hear about GADA3 in the trophoblast before? So although GADA3 is sufficient to turn on trophoblast targets, it's not necessary. The knockout of GADA3 has been around again for quite a long time now and been studied by a number of different groups who've all found interesting phenotypes. The GADA factors play roles in hematopoiesis, lymphopoiesis, uh, craniofacial development, kidney development, many different aspects of development. Um, but they were not reported as having a trophoblast phenotype. However, and those of you in the audience who've looked at mouse mutants before will note that this embryo here looks pretty sick, and it's looking sick in mid-gestation, and it's very similar to many phenotypes caused by placental problems. So I will bet that, in fact, GADA3 mutants do have placental phenotypes. And it is known from work largely in Dan Linsa's lab that GADA2 and 3 together control expression of some of the placental genes, which is consistent with our overexpression studies. But as GADA2 and 3 together, we think that this is a redundancy issue, and we're currently looking at what happens if you make a GADA2-3 double, which is, has not been reported because it's rather difficult to do, suggesting there are, uh, there are very important genes. So GADA3, GADA3 alone does not have an early phenotype. What about its early expression? Is it expressed in the, in the region to suggest that it could be playing a blastocyst role? And the answer there is absolutely yes. So when we look with antibody to GADA3 and compare it with CDX2, CDX2 here is coming up in those outside cells in the late Moira and highly expressed in the outside cells of the blastocyst. GADA3, exactly the same expression pattern. And importantly, we would predict that it's in a parallel pathway to CDX2. And indeed, if you look at uh, CDX2 mutants, where GADA3 is in the wild type in the trophectoderm, here's a mutant, no CDX2, but GADA3 is still nicely expressed in the outside cells. And it's not expressed in T4 mutants. So with Hiroshi Sasaki, we looked at T4. And, the, and as you see with CDX2, no GADA3 in these mutants. So we think that this is a new part of the pathway. We're beginning to add players to the whole trophoblast side of the equation, not surprisingly. Uh, T4 still at the top, uh, with at least two downstream targets. For all we know, there may be more, each of which has some of its overlapping targets and its own targets that lead on to the formation of the trophoblast fate. CDX2 initiates this linear segregation by negatively regulating OT4 and NANOG and that they, in turn, initiate the inner cell mass fate and have a feedback loop here to negatively regulate the downstream pathways of trophoblast development. So this tells us, again, that this stem cell study identifies the genes. The gain-of-function assays in stem cells help us to define the endogenous pathways. But now we've still got another problem. We've started the process, but we still don't know how to, how to get it going. We can get this. Once this is all set up, we're off and running. But how is it that T4 leads to the regulation of CDX2 and GADA3 in the outside cells? The only way to explain how the pathways are set up in the embryo is to go back to the embryo. There's no way around it because stem cells are in maintenance mode. We're looking at initiation mode. So let's go back and look at some embryos. 
So we started with a blastocyst, which has three cell types, but how did it get there? During cleavage, the mouse embryo or a human embryo, the first few cleavages just divide up the embryo into cells that basically all look alike, called blastomeres. And then there's a magic process called compaction and polarization, whereby the embryo starts to compact upon itself due to uh, e-cadherin e adhesion, and the cells start to become polarized in an apical basolateral manner. You see an apical pole on the outside, the basolateral markers on the inside. At the, at, as the embryo compacts and goes from the 8 cell to the 16 cell stage, these cells will divide either symmetrically or asymmetrically, generate more polar cells on the outside, or also generate cells that only carry the basolateral markers on the inside. Setting up a situation then where you have an environment in which the cells on the inside are going to be in a different environment from the outside. Concomitant with that process, we start to see CDX2, which initially is sort of patchy uh, throughout the embryo, as shown diagrammatically here and by antibody staining here, go to a situation where you see it much heavily, highly upregulated in the outside cells and downregulated in the inside cells until the blastocyst stage, in which there's very little CDX2 left in the inside cells at all. So what we're seeing is an association between upregulation of CDX2 in the outside and the formation of this polarized epithelium. So that has led to suggestions that obviously somehow polarity is important for segregating trophoblast sulfate. So what is this process of polarity? It's a very interesting process because in the mouse embryo, you form a polarized epithelium with all the standard markers of a polarized epithelium, but you do it de novo. And you can actually watch the process. You can watch the process here. Uh, this is an embryo injected with Ezra and GFP. And you can see the poles starting to form, spreading out over the cells. And then as the embryo divides, these polar regions become restricted to the outside cells, this polar marker, and you see this group of cells in the inside that lack that, those apical markers. So it's a de novo generation, very interesting to understand how that occurs and why it occurs at that stage. What we also see, and this was proposed by Martin Johnson many years ago, that once you get that polarity, you have the possibility of asymmetric cell divisions generating inside and outside cells that could indeed be the precursors of the, out, the polar cells will go on to form the trophectoderm, and the apolar inside cells will form the inner cell mass. And now we can also watch that process. So this is another movie. In this case, we've injected a membrane marker and a histone GFP. And you're seeing two kinds of cell divisions here. Watch this one. Here's the pole. This is a symmetric division. That pole is divided between the two progeny. Over here, here's the polar region. This is an asymmetric division, generated an outer polar cell, inheriting the pole there, and an inner apolar cell. So that's the process that leads to the segregation. That's fine, and that's the cell biology of it, but is that process actually required for localized CDX2 expression? They follow each other. We don't see a uh, high level on the outside until polarity occurs, but is it really necessary? Is it perhaps that the apical polarity region, the polarized epithelium, is actually required to upregulate CDX2? So to address that, we need to interfere with formation of the polarized epithelium. So there are a number of ways of doing that. I'm going to show you one such example here. This is work from a graduate student, Rob Stevenson. And what he decided to do was to look at embryos that can't make a polarized epithelium because they lack e-cadherin. E-cadherin won't allow the embryos to compact, and e-cadherin is necessary for the cadherin's junctions that lead on to the formation of an organized apical basolateral polarity. And these embryos were generated that what we call maternal zygotic. This is a, a mutant that lacks any maternal or zygotic e cadherin. It's done by a, a Cree excision in the oocyte. So these embryos have no e cadherin at all, and they're very unhappy embryos. Oops. So they look fine. Everybody's dividing happily. Only one of these is going to be wild type, and you'll see that in a minute. This is the wild type. These are the mutants. They can't compact. And they end up in this sort of ball of cells, 
uh, very busy, they're making little cavities, but they cannot form a blastocele. Cell number is not changed, but they cannot form an organized epithelium. So in the absence of an organized epithelium, are all these cells going to be inside cells, or are they all going to be outside cells? What happens to the expression of CDS2? So what Rob found was that if you looked at these mutants and looked at OP4 expression and CDS2 expression, that whether it's a zygotic mutant or a maternal zygotic, very few cells actually express the inside marker at the blastocyst stage equivalent, but almost all the cells express CDX2, whether they're inside or outside. And when he quantitated this, you see here the, the green and the, the peach colors are the zygotic and the maternal mutants, and you see that they have significantly higher percentage of CDX2 mutants, uh, CDX2 expressing cells than the uh, control cells, maternal or the uh, wild type embryos. No change in cell number, so you're getting a higher percentage of cells expressing CDX2. So that says that you need a polarized epithelium to actually limit CDX2 expression. So probably what you need to do is the polarized epithelium is going to be required to set up the inside environment where CDX2 is not expressed. And in the absence of that inside environment, everybody defaults into CDX2 expression. So how does that occur? Well, then we have to go back to our pathway again. And we focused on CDX2 because it's a nice marker. But I already told you that CDX2 is not at the top of this hierarchy. T4 at the moment is at the top of the hierarchy. What I didn't tell you is that T4 is not restricted in its expression to the outside cells. It's expressed throughout the embryo at this stage. So how can it be the driver of this initial differentiation event? Well, to understand that then, we need to understand how T4 is regulated. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what T4 is. It belongs to a transcription factor family that on their own do not activate gene expression, but require specific co-activators. In the mammalian system, the co-activator of T4 is a molecule called YAP. There's, a, there's two molecules, YAP and TAS. YAP is expressed in the early embryo. And when YAP binds to T4 and enters the nucleus, then it can activate downstream transcription. So that suggests then, if T4 is everywhere, but is key for this process, maybe we're looking at the wrong side. We should be looking at YAP distribution to see whether it's important and whether it's restricted. And so this is where uh, we, we started to, to work on this area, but then entered a collaboration with Hiro Suzaki's lab at, CDB, at Rikun CDB in Japan, who's really done the majority of this work and done a very nice uh, body of work here. But what we showed and they showed was just looking with antibody to YAP, that lo and behold, YAP indeed is restricted to the outside cells. But interestingly, this is antibody now, YAP is expressed in the cytoplasm throughout the embryo from the sort of four to eight cell stage on. But as CDX2 becomes restricted to the outside, what you see is that YAP becomes nuclear restricted. Whereas in the, in the inside cells, you see very clearly that it's in the cytoplasm, but not in the nuclei. So the process seems to be that YAT becomes nuclear restricted, and then we start, presumably, to turn on downstream targets like CDX2. All right, so that's good. Now YAP is nuclear restricted. How do we start the process? We have to understand how YAP becomes nuclear localized. Well, how does YAP become nuclear localized? Now this gets us into a whole new signaling pathway, a very popular signaling pathway at the moment that's coming up in a number of different systems. And this is the HIPPO signaling pathway. And this is a pathway that was identified in Drosophila and has also been extensively shown to be important in mammalian cells and in growth control both in Drosophila and in normal and uh, cancer cells in mammalian systems. A lot of activity in this area, and I certainly can't go through all the ins and outs of the HIPPO pathway, but it works in an interesting way. There is a complex here that contains a number of uh, 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 kinases, serine kinases and scaffolds that when activated by some activating signal, which is not, can be different upstream activating signals, this pathway activates what's called warts in Drosophila or the LATS kinases in mammals, which in turn phosphorylates our friend here, YAP. 
And when lac is phosphorylated, serine phosphorylated, it binds to this uh, uh, scaffold protein 14.3.3 in the cytoplasm, and it's kept out of the nucleus. So an activated uh, LATS kinase leads to YAP being excluded from the nucleus, and TED in mammals or the Drosophila recruitment scalloped fails to activate downstream transcription. So when the hippo complex is active, then TED and scalloped are inactive. On the other hand, when there is no activating signal, this complex is not active, the LATS kinase does not phosphorylate Yorkie or YAP, it enters the nucleus, and downstream transcription occurs. This is work from many, many labs, uh, just a few of whom are named here. So it's a very exciting and important growth control pathway. But it looks as though it may have been picked up in its usage then in the early embryo, suggesting, so the question of course becomes, is the LATS kinase important in phosphorylating YAP, and is its activity what's driving the initial segregation of trophoblasts and inner cell mass? So uh, Hiroshi Sasaki's lab did a whole series of experiments, I'm just showing you three of them here, consistent with this hypothesis. First of all, they uh, ectopically expressed the LATS kinase in a, a mouse embryo and showed that, as you might predict, now when you phosphorylate YAP in all the cells, it stays in the cytoplasm, we can't activate CDX2 expression in the outside cells. A dominant negative form of LATS causes ectopic expression of CDX2 in the inside cells. And this is an, a YAP that cannot be serine phosphorylated. So if you overexpress this form, it can't be phosphorylated. It's constitutively in the nucleus. And we see CDX2 again ectopically in the inside cells. So a series of experiments suggesting that, excitingly, this really is the pathway that initiates development. So more questions, of course, but it's very nice because this is a post-translational event that leads to transcriptional consequences. And if you want to initiate linear segregation, that's what you need to do. So we think that the, the pathway is working somehow in this way. The inner cells, hippo pathway is activated by some process that we still have to understand. Uh, and activation of that essentially uh, keeps YAP out of the nucleus, keeps this in the pluripotent lineage, and prevents activation of the trophoblast uh, markers. There seems to be some interaction, obviously, with polarity. Polarity seems still to be important. Whether polarity is, is actually directly activating this pathway or simply preventing the hippo activation remains to be seen. And I think it's going to be important again, since this is clearly important for maintaining the inside cells to go down the pluripotent path, we need to ask whether this pathway is also important for promoting pluripotency in ES cells. So questions to be answered, but really a whole new way of looking at the initial events. We're getting very close to understanding how to make this segregation. So let's just switch, however, to, a, to a, the next lineage event that we understand much less about. And that's the formation of the epiblast or the primitive endoderm. We're beginning, but we don't understand at all essentially how that occurs. But we have some interesting observations that suggest it's going to occur by a somewhat different mechanism to this environmental signaling that leads to the separation of the inner cell mass and the true effectoderm. So what we see in the embryo, what we see is that here's our three and a half day uh, blastocyst again the inner cell mass, all the cells expressing OCT4, all the cells look the same. One day later, the primitive endoderm forms on the surface. And that suggested uh, to me and to many others that it might again be some kind of position-dependent determination, that inside cells somehow would be in a different environment to the outside cells. The outside cells would then go on to form primitive endoderm. So we might be looking for signaling pathways, as I just showed you, in the formation of the blastocyst. However, uh, recent experiments, largely from, from my lab and then uh, confirmed in other labs, suggest this might not be quite the case. That rather than being position-dependent determination, we have a situation where even at three and a half days, there's a mosaic of progenitors within the inner cell mass. And this came from, largely from work by a postdoc, Yoshi Yamanaka, who undertook a series of lineage tracing experiments where he marked single cells in the three and a half day inner cell mass using a Cree lineage tracing system. So essentially injecting Cree messenger RNA into single cells, which would then excise a marker so that all the progeny of that cell express a GFP marker. So he simply marked single cells and asked what happens to them? 
if all the cells are the same, we'd expect single cells in some situations to be able to make both epiblast and primitive endoderm. But that's not what he saw. What he saw was that if you mark a single cell, they end up either as a clone in the epiblast or as a clone in the primitive endoderm, but never crossed. He did a whole set of other experiments where he took single cells out of the embryo, put them back in another one, and asked what do they do. And again, in a, in a blastocyst injection, single cells, either epiblast or primitive endoderm, very rarely both. And even if you put them back earlier in development, gave them more time to divide and change their minds, still, they ended up primarily in epiblast or primitive endoderm, and only a couple that would actually cross the boundary. Suggesting then that even early in development, cells might be restricted to one cell type or another. Well, we started to look at gene expression, we started to see that that might well be the case and that the markers, the, the transcription factors that are important for linear specification actually are also mosaically expressed prior to formation of the primitive endoderm. And this was simply looking at uh, uh, GATA6 by antibody. This is a primitive endoderm marker. And before you see a primitive endoderm, there are cells throughout the inner cell mass, including inside, that express GATA6. Now, if you saw patchy expression earlier in some of my pictures, it's very high in some cells, but not others within the inner cell mass. And here's just an overlay. This is an in situ. We're overlaying in situ to GATA6 and NANOG. And you'll see that they're complementary. So you get a complementary expression of these key transcription factors prior to any morphological uh, difference. And there's no geographical constraint on these cells. So rather than position-dependent determination, we actually think that there's an early determination at least by the mature blastocyst stage, and work from Katagentinarchus' lab recently has suggested that earlier on they may still go down both pathways. But by the mature expanded blastocyst, we have this mosaic of epiblast and primitive endoderm progenitors, which then somehow have to sort themselves out to form epiblast and primitive endoderm. Clearly a different mechanism, and if we want to understand then the formation of this lineage decision, we have to understand how we make this mosaic within the inner cell mass. So what do we know about that? Much less. We're still at the early stages, but we have some clues and we can, out of which we can make a model which we're in the process of testing. We know that we have a mosaic of progenitors, and we also know that to generate that mosaic of gene expression and progenitors in the cell mass requires active signaling again, it's not HIPPO signaling this time. It's receptor tyrosine kinase signaling, and most likely receptor tyrosine kinase signaling downstream of FGF signaling. The first clue to that came from work uh, in which uh, Claire Schozo, postdoc in the lab, took again an old mutant that Tony Porson's lab had made several years ago. It's a mutant in GRAB2. And GRAB2, as you probably know, is an important uh, signal transduction molecule linking a number of different tyrosine kinase receptors to the RASMAP kinase pathway. And they had reported that GRAB2 mutants lack primitive endoderm. So we went back and looked at GRAB2 mutants and asked, what happens to this early mosaicism within the inner cell mass? And what you see in GRAB2 mutants is they have no primitive endoderm, and all of the inner cell mass becomes epiblast. So here on the top, just looking at nanog expression in a wild-type blastocyst, and here's a GRAB2 mutant on the bottom, same number of cells, looks perfectly normal. You would not be able to tell it apart just down the microscope. But if you stay with nanog, now all the cells have high-level nanog and none of them express GATA6. You see it here in an overlay. So you're getting a transition then. Instead of a mosaic, all the cells are taking up the epiblast pathway. So we've now been exploring that a bit further, and uh, uh, a graduate student, Cody, along with Yojero again, have been doing some preliminary experiments where we've asked whether this RTK signaling is actually FGF signaling. FGF4 is expressed in the inner cell mass, FGF4 mutants have primitive endoderm defects not well defined. FGF receptor mutants also have uh, endoderm defects not well defined. So what they've done in a preliminary assay before we go ahead and look more at the mutants is just treat embryos with FGF receptor inhibitors, of which there are very nice specific chemical inhibitors these days, or uh, just FGF. And what you see here is that if you treat uh, a bla an embryo from the eight cell stage to the blastocyst, with the specific SUGEN inhibitor, then 
Now, again, all the cells become nanopositive. So FG, blocking FGS signaling blocks mosaicism. Everybody becomes epiblast. And the reverse seems to be also true. If we uh, grow uh, embryos in high levels of FGF4 uh, and heparin over the same period, then nanog, which should be, is coming up in, in the orange here, seems to be lost, and we're getting more cells expressing GATA4. So more FGF, we get uh, uh, more endoderm. Reduced FGF, we lose endoderm, suggesting then that this really is what's separating epiblast and primitive endoderm fate. OK, fine. That's fine. We know we're signaling, but that doesn't explain how you could get a mosaic of progenitors. Why is it that some cells respond to FGF and become primitive endoderm in a kind of apparently random manner, and others don't? So we have a hypothesis. I don't know if it's true, but it's testable. And the hypothesis is shown here, and it's a combination of this uh, understanding that there are asymmetric cell divisions that take place to generate the inside cells, and the understanding that turning on the FGF receptor, which we know, is involved in trophoblast development. So a 16-cell embryo has undergone one round of these asymmetric cell divisions, puts a set of cells on the inside, um, but those cells are not going to express the FGF receptor because the trophoblast pathway has not been initiated. However, at this stage, we're getting CDX2 coming on in the outside cells. The FGF receptors, which are involved in trophoblast development and downstream of CDX2, perhaps will start to be expressed in these cells. And now you can imagine that in the next round of polarized cell divisions, if the cells divide symmetrically, you'll generate two more outside trophectoderm cells. But if you divide asymmetrically, you'll generate an inside cell, but that inside cell is now going to inherit the FGF receptor expression. So now you can end up with two kinds of progenitors. The first round won't have the receptor. The second round will. Now, even if they all express FGF4, it's only the cells with the receptor that are going to respond to, to FGF and become primitive endoderm. So that's the model, and you can start thinking about several different tests of that model, and we're, we're in the process of testing the model right now. But it is a mechanism to explain both the requirement for signaling and a combination of lineage decisions that will end up with this uh, separation of the cell types. So, those then, I hope, illustrate to you how you can look at embryonic events uh, and begin to understand signaling pathways that are not only important for the embryo, but are also important for stem cells. If we think just about this one that I've just shown you, I've shown you a situation in which we can interfere with signaling and turn all of the inner cell mass towards the pluripotent phenotype the pluripotent phenotype that's going to be the cells that give rise to pluripotent embryonic stem cells. So clearly suggesting then that if we interfere with FGS signaling during embryonic development, we may actually push all the inner cell masses to pluripotent epiblast cells, and that might be a very good way of deriving more uh, and more efficiently embryonic stem cells. And Jenny Nichols in, uh, in Austin Smith Group has actually shown that that's true in the mouse, and obviously the question is whether this could be applied in humans as well. So understanding lineage decisions is important for understanding how pluripotency arises, how it is separated, and how you control those, those decision-making events. So my take-home message, uh, I'm not sure if this was the one that was on those uh, learning objectives, but here it is. My take-home message is that understanding stem cell lineage specification and maintenance helps define the genetic pathways that we can use to understand how the embryo develops. But also, understanding the embryo gives us clues as to stem cell origins and as to new pathways that may be important for stem cells in vitro. So I will stop there and acknowledge the, the people who've taken part in the, most of the unpublished stuff that I showed you today, as well as some of the old published stuff. Yojo Yamanaka has been uh, key in many of the manipulation experiments in the early embryo and the whole, the, all of the uh, live imaging. Amy Ralston's been working on um, CDX2, TED4, and uh, uh, GATA3 in trophoblast. Rob Stevenson's been looking at the role of polarity in separating inner cell mass and trophoblast. And Katie is a new student who's been looking at the role of FGF in primitive endoderm formation. Brian Cox does all the bioinformatic analysis that really allows us to sort through the microarray analysis and apply it back to the embryo. 
Claire Scherzer and Dan, Dan Strumpf were ex-lab members on some of the uh, published work. Very important collaborations with uh, Hiroshi uh, Sasaki and Yuki Nishioka on the T4 and the YAP story, and uh, uh, the initial work on CDX2 and, and the assays in embryonic stem cells, collaboration with Hitoshi Niwa. We could not do a lot of this without support of great people who work on, in our transgenic facility and really help us to work with embryos and derive all these uh, nice uh, studies. Uh, and some of the, um, the high throughput stuff was done in collaboration with the BC Genome Center. Thank you. Can we take any questions now? Any questions, Ron? So Ron's asking, uh, in the trophoblast stem cells uh, and in the Zen cells, in fact, uh, they have paternal X inactivation, as do the extra embryonic cells. Does it make a difference? That's a good question. You'd have to deactivate the, the, the paternal X. The fact is that the trophoblast stem cells retain that paternal X inactivation, uh, and people are using that as a nice system to look at the processes of, of paternal X inactivation. Um, I don't know if it's important or not, but it's certainly there. Has anyone looked at uh, blasto, um, blastocyst formation under um, microgravity conditions? Uh -huh. um, I don't know about blastocyst formation. Um, can anybody help me here? Because I know that they have sent rats up, pregnant rats up into space. Uh, and uh, as far as I, can, as I remember, they get pregnant and they're fine. So there's, there's no, um, no particular role for gravity in, in the formation of, of the blastocyst axis. Uh, in the chick, however, there is some evidence that gravity helps to affect the, um, uh, form, the, the asymmetry that leads to the primitive streak. You can actually interfere that with, with that with gravity. Probably in the mouse, because it's held within the uterus, it's getting different kinds of signals, and, and gravity is less important. Um, it's a good question. Thank you. In a, in a sort of take-home lesson, uh, the, regarding fate and perhaps manipulation of that fate. Am I correct in understanding that the transcriptional factors are truly deterministic in the sense they are necessary and sufficient and no other magic stuff is involved? It's all so simple. Um, uh, well, of course, you know, this, this is very topical these days because uh, the, the whole uh, realm of being able to reprogram adult cells to pluripotency suggests that a few transcription factors are, are necessary and sufficient. And I would say that most of the results I've shown you here fall into the same kind of category, that if you have the right transcription factor, you can certainly do quite a, a dramatic switch of cell fate. But it's worth pointing out that in those, in those trophoblast assays, we can take an embryonic stem cell, we can add a trophoblast transcription factor X or trophoblast transcription factor Y, and we will get sets of trophoblast genes turned on, but we won't have exactly the same phenotype. So there are, to get the full phenotype, you probably have to have more than one, and you need to start these whole uh, cassettes uh, of uh, pathways. But would you guess, will it be possible to manipulate, you know, one fate to the other fate? I mean, you yes. mentioned... Yes, I think so. Yes. If you know the right pathways. You also have to know, for the stem cells, you must not only change the transcription factor environment, you have to change the growth factor environment if you want to keep them dividing. So the external environment of the cell C is also going to be as, as important, perhaps, as the internal environment within the nucleus. So how long the trophoectoderm and the epiblast, they maintain this ability of plasticity? How many days after? They don't. So this is the difference between a stem cell where you can essentially, as it were, freeze the cells in that particular state uh, and the embryo itself. So the trophoblast, the, the blastocyst, forms at three and a half days. 
the later trophoblast cells, and indeed even the trophoblast stem cells, cannot regenerate a blastocyst. So there's a very limited period whereby you get this epithelial formation uh, and this, that, that protects the inside inner cell mast cell. I actually think that the outer epithelium of the blastocyst is not really trophoblast. It's a polarized epithelium that generates a blastocyl. And its role is to generate an inside environment to allow pluripotency to occur. Then, later on, it differentiates into trophoblasts that's required for implantation and formation of the placenta. But its initial role is clearly to limit pluripotency. <laughs>